فإنها لا تعمل الأبصار لا تعمل الأبصار ولكن تعمل القلوب التي في الصدور صدق الله العظيم Will they not travel to the earth? Perchance that by traveling to the earth their dead heart, sleeping heart might come alive فإنها لا تعمل أبصار is not these eyes which are blind ولكن تعمل قلوب التي في الصدور what is blind is the heart inside the chest the internal blindness indicates no spirituality and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a warning. He says, Man kana fi hadhihi a'ma Whosoever is blind here in this world. For huwa fi l'akhilati a'ma He'll be blind in the next world as well. Wa adzalla sabil And even more misguided. And what's the punishment for internal blindness? Again, he speaks and he says, "وَلَقَدْ زَرَأْنَا لِجَهَنَّمَ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنْسِ." Huge numbers are now heading for the hellfire. لَهُمْ كُلُوهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا They have hearts and are incapable of using their hearts for acquiring knowledge and understanding. وَلَهُمْ أَعْيُنٌ لَا يُبْسِرُونَ بِهَا And they have eyes and yet cannot see. وَلَهُمْ عَذَانٌ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا And they have ears and yet cannot hear. The cries of the oppressed. Ulaika kalanam. Such people who do not have spirituality, who do not have the capacity for internal sight, they are just like cattle. Malhum adal. Rather, they are more misguided than cattle. These are the ones who are heedless. Here are three. Here are three ayat of the Quran which deliver a powerful message of warning to us. And that's enough I need not elaborate on it. And then we turn to the, the surah of internal insight. You call it surah chahaya, <laughs> surah to nur. And in surah to nur, there is an ayah called ayah to nur. And that ayah delivers to you the methodology for the acquisition of nur. But that's not our subject tonight. At the end of the ayah, Allah speaks of Noorun ala Noor. And how does He end the ayah? Wallahu bi kulli shayin alim. And so spirituality is not for working karamat, <laughs> miracles. 
extraordinary events, eh? No. The purpose of spirituality as given in this verse of the Quran is linked with knowledge. The capacity to understand. This acquisition of knowledge takes a turn in Akhiru Zaman. Akhiru Zaman is different from the rest of history. And spirituality has a strategic role to play in Akhiru Zaman. The most learned of all men is not the graduate of the Dalulu. <laughs> no. So Musa al-Islam says, I want to meet the most learned of all men. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you'll meet him at Majma'ul Bahrain, the place where the two oceans meet. And uh, this is not Mukkam, it is Mutashabiha. This is not something to be explained with tafsir. This is something which has to be interpreted that way. And so it's North Atlantic and Pacific. It is the ocean of knowledge externally acquired. So you've got to burn the midnight oil. If you don't plant, you cannot reap. That law is valid for all people except one. Who is he? The banker. <laughs> He's the only one who reaps without planting. Why? Because he, he's reaping what the donkeys are planting. <laughs> so, so, if you do not plant, you cannot reap. So, there is a world of knowledge that is externally acquired. And you're not going to get that knowledge served for you on a plate. You've got to work for it. You got to struggle. But there is another world of knowledge that modern Western civilization refuses to accept. And I'm talking about, therefore, all the universities of the world today with their secularized system of education. Then there is another world of knowledge other than one which is externally acquired. And that is a world of knowledge which is internally received. And when these two worlds of knowledge, listen to the words, when these two worlds of knowledge are harmoniously integrated with each other, then you have the learned one capable of understanding the world in Akhiru Zaman. I don't know any politician who qualifies. <laughs> I don't know any bureaucrat who qualifies. I don't know any academic, secularized academic who qualifies. And yet these are the people who control our affairs. They have eyes and yet cannot see. This Majma'ul Bahrain, or when the two oceans meet and are harmoniously integrated with each other, produces the man par excellence of spirituality. And he is Khidr alayhi salam. And so if you want to build a Darululu, producing the ulama who have a chance of succeeding 
in akhiru zaman you need to follow khidr alayhi salam he is someone who got the name khidr because he came to a land which was barren and when he sat down everything became green and so his knowledge is not mechanical repeated again and again and again and again for 50 60 80 years is not the product of a maulana or ustaz factory <laughs> that he is someone whose knowledge is as fresh as the raindrops falling from the sky and when he speaks, his words reach the heart and changes the lives of people. The Christians have a term, they call it born again Christian. <laughs> born again, yeah. It is as though he brought you back to life with his words. Because these are not mere words now. These are like raindrops falling from the sky. This is Khidr alayhi salam. When you have that internal insight, that internal intuitive spiritual insight, you are then capable of studying the whole Qur'an and if you believe that this Ummah can be taken out of the mess in which it is today other than through the Qur'an you're dreaming <laughs> only the Qur'an can take us out of the situation in which we are today and if you cannot access one half of the Qur'an what good are you as a scholar? There is one part of the Quran which is known as Ayat Muhkama, and everybody can access that plain and fair. But Allah, in His wisdom, gave us another part of the Quran which cannot be accessed except with spirituality. And if you are to understand Akhiru Zaman, it is that part in particular you have to benefit. And if you are to respond to the challenges and the dangers of Akhiru Zaman, it is that part. A simple ayah. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْأَهِلَّةِ Allah speaks with only a few words. And they question thee about the moon, the moon, when it is born, it's a baby, a new moon, a crescent moon. And they question thee about the Hilal. Kul, hiya mawakitu dinnas. That Hilal represents a system of time of sacred time and you better not depart from that system of sacred time not just the measurement of time but living with it what happens when we are negligent of living with the moon Shall I tell you? He said, Time will move faster and faster. To such an extent that the whole year will pass. And a whole month will pass like a week. And a whole week will pass like a day. And the whole day will pass like an hour. 
Through all the past that the amount of time it takes to kindle a fire. So if you have the perception the time is moving faster and faster for you, I have a message for you. You're in plenty of trouble. I have a message for you. You are in plenty of trouble. Why? Because you have abandoned the system of time ordained by Allah. This is just one ayah of the Quran. And if you want to recover that system of time, which when you live with it, this will disappear. A year will pass like a year. And a month will pass like a month. And a week will pass like a week, yes. You will live a different life. It is the Quran that will bring you back to that system of time. Because you have to recite the whole Quran once a moon. Once a moon you recite. So you know that the fourth day of the month is now finished. And tonight is the fifth day of the month. And the Jal's secularized world of time, out of the window. This is one of the prices that we'll pay when we do not have spirituality. We lack the capacity to even understand what are the implications of time moving faster and faster. As time moves faster and faster, our capacity to think becomes less and less. We don't have time to think anymore. As time moves faster and faster, you lose silence. You begin to live in a world which is more and more noisy. Noisy. Because you are gravitated towards the center, towards the cities. And peace and quiet and silence is in Kampung, in the remote countryside. But as you live and you are seduced into the fast lane of life, you can't live in Kampung anymore. You die. If I go back to live in Kampung, I'll go crazy. They'll have to send me in a hospital. <laughs> so you're in plenty of trouble when you lack spirituality. This is not the only reason why we need spirituality. It is strategically important. Well, why we need to see with two eyes, the jar sees with one. You know that. The jar sees with one because he's internally blind. But your Lord is not one eye. The other reason why we need spirituality in Akhiru Saman is because the jar comes with two things, a river and a fire. But his river is a fire. And his fire is the cool waters of a river. And so, listen to the words, appearance and reality are often opposite to each other. And if judgment is made on the basis of an examination of the external form of things, you can be wrong, as Musa was wrong, alayhi salam. He was wrong with the boat. He was wrong with the boy. He was wrong with the wall. Which surah? Which surah? Surah to the camp. And who was correct? Khidr alayhi salam. The one who had internal insight. This is the ta'wil, he said to Musa, of that which you could not understand. This is the wheel. This is the interpretation of the events. That this is why I did what I did to the boat. This is why I did what I did to the boy and what I did to the wall. 
And so if you lack spirituality and you make judgment based on the external form of things, you can be wrong as he was wrong three times. When we apply this, this is enough for the first part of the topic. When we apply this now, and we turn to Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, how did he apply spirituality? Hmm? <laughs> spirituality for him was not sitting down in the corner and making zikr. That has its benefit. But that is not the heart of spirituality. No. That has its benefit. But that's just a step on the way. <laughs> Nabi Muhammad wasalam, has to deal with the dunya. As we have to deal with the dunya. And if you want to deal successfully with the dunya, you need spirituality, which is what politicians don't have. I'm talking about political affairs, about the economy, about money, about strategic affairs, about military affairs. These are all part and parcel of living in this dunya. And uh, we have made the hijra to Mad Medina. And now we have a little bit of safety. But Makkah is biting their fingernails with frustration that they, we have escaped from them. And Makkah wants to come after us. So we don't have much time to prepare. But when we reach the marina, after 17 months in marina, it became plain and clear that the Jews have rejected Nabi Muhammad and rejected the Quran and are now plotting and planning our destruction. And so we acted decisively when they violated the agreement with us. And we expelled them from, from Medina and they went to Khaiba. Hmm? And over there in Khaiba, they're biting their fingernails in anger. They are our mortal enemies. So we have enemies to the north, the northwest, and we have enemies to the south. And we in the middle. The Jews are now attempting to form an alliance with Makkah. And if they succeed in that alliance, that's it, we finish. We are sandwiched. This is called the strategic environment. And Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam is a political leader here. And he has to examine the world around him with insight, spiritual insight. And he has to be able to formulate plans with which to be able to change the environment and make it less dangerous for him. I see only one leader in the world today doing that. Only one. And that is Putin, President Putin of Russia. But of course, my Salafi critics don't agree with me. They only have two words to say. Putin this and Putin that and Assad this and Assad that. <laughs> doing nothing. With his feet frozen in concrete. For how long? Pakistan was born in 1947. The Kashmir problem began in 1947. And this is 2019. How many years? 
53, 63, 73, 72 years. For 72 years with your feet in concrete and no initiative to try to change the strategic environment to make it more favorable for you eh? until after 73 years Modi comes and hit you for a six in the bamboo. You play cricket? <laughs> yeah. The Indian government is openly hostile to Islam. It doesn't hide its hostility. And the Indian government is in an open strategic, strategic alliance with Israel. It doesn't hide it. No. At least it is honest about this. And the Indian government is moving forward. Some may say cunningly, I say intelligently. Oh yes, they are my enemy. But I recognize that they are functioning intelligently. And they are formulating their plans and strategies intelligently. And they are moving ahead. Yes. And so after 73 years of static, no movement, suddenly Kashmir is thrown out into the bamboo. No, Nabi Muhammad would not do that. He has to prevent an alliance of the Jews in Khaybar with the Mushrikeen of Mecca. How to do it? He is at war with Mecca, and yet he embarks on a peace offensive. <laughs> he says, I'm going to perform the Umrah. The whole of Arabia recognizes I have the right to perform the Umrah, and the Quraysh have no right to prevent me from performing the Umrah. So he has, in, he has embarked upon a very sensible and intelligent peace offensive. But if the Quraysh allows him to enter into Mecca and perform the Umrah while he's at war with them, all of Arabia will sat, sit down and laugh and laugh and laugh. It would be a loss of faith for the Quraysh. So what he did was to put them on the horns of a dilemma. They can't do this, they can't do that. And when he set off from Medina, from Mecca, the Quraysh realized this is trouble. We have to prevent him from reaching the area where it's haram. So they sent Khalid bin Walid with 200 horsemen. But we took the deviations and we were able to elude them. And we reached Hudaybiyah. They cannot attack us in Hudaybiyah. We are in safe territory. Mm. So Nabi Muhammad wasalam, succeeded in forcing the enemy to the negotiating table. MashaAllah. What a man. What a leader. And when he forced them to the negotiating table, he realized that they needed something for saving their face. So they said, okay, this year, Taboli, go back. Next year you can come. <laughs> we said, no problem. <laughs> this year we we'll go back, next year we we'll come. They said, make all your kurban right here in Hudaybiyah. We said, no problem, we make the Qurban. Nobody wants to make Qurban. Because this was never done ever in history. It had to be done there in Makkah. 
So then one of the wives of the prophet said, you take the knife and cut. <laughs> and then he made the first kurban. They said, any of our slaves who leave Mecca and go to join you in Madin, send them back. But any from there who come to us, we don't send them back. We said, no problem. <laughs> no problem. Why? Because there is a difference between um, Baras and Nasi. Baras is the, is the rice with the husk. And Nasi is the rice without the husk. So what is the husk? Baras? Pani, Pani. There's a difference in diplomacy between the Pani and the Nasi. That is just Pani. This is Nasi. Because they had to agree no war. So that when he enters into Mecca, there'll be no war. We're not at war with him, so nobody would laugh. So they said, uh, was it 10 years? 10 years. We said, no problem. If they had said five, we'd accept the five. <laughs> we got what we wanted. Our objective is to deal with the more dangerous of the two enemies. We cannot attack Khaiba while we are still at war with Mecca. Because if we leave Medina to attack Khaiba, Mecca will come and take Medina. See? Nor can we leave Medina to attack Mecca. Because if we do that, Khaiba will come and take Medina. But if Khaiba, if Khaiba comes to take Medina when we have gone to Allah's house, all of Arabia will come and slaughter Khaiba. The whole of Arabia will combine to go and slaughter Khaiba. These people have gone on pilgrimage when you come to capital the city. See? So when Mecca offered 10 years, we said, thank you very much. That's what we wanted. And then we left and we went back. And do you know what happened when we went back? When you engage in strategic planning, you don't make everything public. I cannot, exp I cannot reveal what are my strategic plans for Kashmir, no. I will give you part of it, but the other part I can't make public, no. So Nabi Muhammad is silent. We return to Medina. He says nothing. We spend two weeks in Medina. He says nothing. And then suddenly he gives the order. We're marching on Khaybar. And he gave orders, horsemen to go to all the roads around Medina to intercept anyone coming out to check that no news to leave. And they were able to intercept, intercept someone with a letter who was sending a message to warn Khaiba that the attack was coming. And we caught that man and we caught the letter. Yes, this is, this is the leader who has planning. So when we attack Khaiba, Khaiba knew nothing of the attack. It came as a surprise to them. They came out in the morning to go to their fields and they saw Muhammad alayhi salatu was and his army. It was a surprise, absolute surprise. On that day, Makkah fell, it's just a matter of time. Have you understood that? The strategic implications of the fall of Khaybar was that Mecca had been outmaneuvered. 
they could not attack Medina while we were in Khaiba because they had a peace treaty with us. And they gave us the opportunity to be able to attack Khaiba and eliminate Khaiba. So on the day that Khaiba fell, Mecca fell, it's just a matter of time. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used spiritual insight in his strategic planning. So spirituality is not for performing miracles. Spirituality is not for be able people to say, wow, wow what a great shape he is. <laughs> Spirituality is for application in the life of this world, in the affairs of this world. And Nabi Muhammad gave a wonderful ex 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 uh, application of spirituality in the events which led to the conquest of Mecca. I have cut it short for you. Now let us turn. If we had applied spirituality to the world today, this Ummah, understanding that Dajjal is the one, Dajjal is the one who is in control of the world today, then we would have been able, using insight, to recognize that the Ottoman Empire and the Mughal Empire were sisters. The Ottoman Empire played the Jazz game for him. They served the interests of the Jazz like Saudi Arabia is doing today, but Imran Khan doesn't understand that. The Ottoman Empire functioned essentially for sabotage. What is the Balkhasa word for sabotage? Huh? Give me the Balkhasa word, sabotage. Oh, no, 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 no. You use sabotage in bah Bahasa? Ayana. Huh? Ayana. Ayana? Khianat. Khianat is deception. Khianat is an Arabic word, deception. No, this is sabotage. Huh? All right, go back to school and learn your Bahasa. We are destined in the end time to have friendly relations with part of the Christian world because they are the ones who are going to be closest in love and affection for us. Who said that? The Quran, yes, the Quran. Which surah? Al-Ma'idah. Al-Ma'idah. And the Quran further refines it and identifies them as Rum. And the whole Surah of the Quran is entitled Surah al Rum. And we know their city was Al Hum. It was Constantinople. I have a book outside. Perhaps for the first time someone had written a book on Constantinople in the Quran. It's outside. Small book. And so we are destined to have friendship and alliance in Akhir Zaman with Rome. And Rome is going to be closest in love and affection for us. Rome today are the Orthodox Christians, where a man cannot marry another man and get a marriage certificate. If you say that Rome is the Yankee 
the Yankee room and the French room and the Western room where a man could marry another man and get a marriage certificate you are more misguided than the donkey donkeys are not misguided incidents <laughs> and so what the Ottoman Empire did was to wage 600 years of bogus jihad on these people the very people with whom we are destined to have friendship and alliance and the bogus jihad on these people to, to inject into them hatred for Islam this is called sabotage if you have spiritual insight you would recognize the role of the Ottoman Empire and you will take action formulate strategy to be able to erase those efforts of sabotage which is what I did with the Orthodox Christian world but I had the Hadith to help me that you will conquer Constantinople and I then I interpreted that the conquest of Constantinople in Akhiru Zaman is first of all to return Hagia Sophia to the Orthodox Christian world and when we return that cathedral to them and we apologize to them for what the Ottomans did that will clear the way for the re reconciliation and friendship and alliance but it has already started with the orthodox christian world if we had spiritual insight 400 million muslims in india and pakistan and bangladesh and sri lanka if we had spiritual insight we would recognize that the Mughal Empire played the same role as the Ottoman Empire to sabotage our relations with the Hindu world and in the same way that the Ottomans took Hagia Sophia which was at the heart of the Christian world to plunge a dagger into their hearts that will last forever the blood will continue to the Mughals did the same thing with Babri Masjid yes it is not a matter of any importance at all to us whether there is any evidence that someone called Ram was born in Babri that is irrelevant to us but it is awfully relevant to 400 million Muslims in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh the, where is the evidence? where is the evidence? what is important to us is that this is in the religious consciousness of the Hindu he believes that his god Bahram was born in Babri yes, it's always been that and so when you come and you take that spot out of the whole of India this is the spot you choose and you build a masjid that's what the Mughal Empire did the Mughal Empire is following in the footsteps of the Ottoman Empire to plant a dagger in the heart of the Hindu world that will cause eternal hatred for Islam and then not only <laughs> did the Ottomans rule over them for four, five, six hundred years the Mughals, the Muslims ruled over the Hindus for about eight hundred years and this is called hatred in the hearts of the Hindus for Islam if I were 
an Orthodox Christian and I had suffered under the Ottomans and I did not know what the Quran says that the Ottomans violated the Allah's law in the Quran and I would hate Islam but if you come to me and teach me that Allah's law says this and the Ottomans did that then I know that I can't blame Islam if I were a Hindu and I had to suffer with this indignity that the Muslims came and ruled over my people for 800 years I never invited them they came to rule over me by the point of a sword from Afghanistan and they took the birthplace of Ram to be their Muslim then unless you can come to me and show me this is not Islam I would hate Islam and so the solution to the problem of Kashmir does not lie in making a deal with Trump that yes we will help you to get out of Afghanistan after we supported you for 14 years to kill our brothers in Afghanistan in return for US dollars after we supported you we fought America's war for America this is what Imran Khan said we fought America's war for America for 14 years and in return we got US dollars huh? we will now help you to get out of Afghanistan provided you this is the quid pro quo you help us with Kashmir huh? no people with spiritual insight don't go and negotiate with shaitan the Ayatollah Khamenei in Iran will never make a deal with Pakistan with the United States like that. No. Putin wouldn't make such a deal. Putin is too much of a gentleman to make such a deal. Pakistan was trying to make with Trump. And again, not only that, I wouldn't travel to Washington is what he did. <laughs> no. It's it's a silly mistake on his part. And I feel sad really to use this language for Imran Khan because I consider him to be better than the rotten politicians who came before him. But it's clear that he's making mistakes. But then these are also the mistakes that everyone made before him. <laughs> if we are to apply the strategic sunnah to Kashmir, what part of that strategic sunnah can we make public? Strategy. There is one part of the strategy we cannot, of course, make public. But there is a part that we can make public. The first step on the way, which is now perhaps too late, after what Modi has just done, the first step on the way was for Pakistan and the Muslims of India and the Muslims of Bangladesh to declare that Muslim rule over India was in conflict with the Quran. That's right. That it was Islamic imperialism and we denounce it. The Hindu world would be surprised to hear that. And there are many Hindus who has, whose hearts have not as yet been totally corrupted with hatred for Islam who would welcome hearing from the Muslims their denunciation of Muslim rule over India that is the first step of the strategic sunnah the second step of the strategic sunnah is for the Muslims to not only denounce Muslim rule over Hindu India but also 
to give up any claims to boundary. India is a big country. We don't ask of you to give us another plot of land where we can build a masjid. No. Out of respect for the religious sentiments of the Hindu people who believe that Ram was born in Babri, we voluntarily give up any claim to Babri. Does that make sense? Do you think there's any Muslim in those 400 million in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh will ever believe in that? That's where you have to look for Islamic spirituality. There is something more we can say in the strategic sunnah. The religious way of life requires that we should have correct beliefs. We should declare that what, there is a God and He is one God. That we must believe in the angels and we must live in the life hereafter, Akhira and so But uh, if we have correct beliefs, but we do not have correct conduct, Allah says, but your religion is worth nothing. This is very, very, very strong language. You kezibu, you lying, says Allah. You're lying if you say you have deen. No. When you are harsh with the orphan and you do not feed the poor and needy. Hmm? أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يُكَذِّبُ بِالدِّينِ فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَرْجُعُ الْيَتِيمِ وَلَا يَقُدُّ عَلَى تَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينِ In other words, the right conduct is as much a part of the deen as right beliefs. And so when you find someone with right conduct, stop where you are. Do some investigation. How could this man have a right conduct? When he gives his word, he keeps his word. He never cheats anyone. He never lies. He is charitable. He's kind. He does not violate the rights of others. From where did this man get this righteous conduct? Answer, there must be something in his beliefs which has led him to righteous conduct. So yes, he may be worshipping idols, but so long as this man is not hostile to me, does not reject the deen, reject Muhammad reject the Quran as an open enemy of mine, so long he's not a kafir. I have a duty to go and search to see what is it that produces this righteous conduct. And when I find in the Buddhist, I find that Gautama Buddha gave him this righteous conduct. And I find in the Vedas, the Hindu Vedas, that the Vedas are the foundation of honesty in politics, honesty in business. Then I say, this is a remnant of truth. And one of the functions, one of the functions of the Quran is Muhaiminun Ali to protect whatever remains of the truth in the world. And so I have a duty now to show respect for the Hindu faith, to show respect for the Buddhist faith. So long as the Buddhist is not in alliance with Israel, waiting to cut my throat, 
which gets, he's a kafir, he's my enemy. That other Buddhist who is not like that, that other Hindu who is not like that, I have a duty to reach out to him and show respect for his religion. Have, uh, <laughs> have India and Pakistan and Bangladesh Muslims ever attempted to do that? Mm -hmm. If you show respect for the Hindu religion, and if you say that this religion could not have re produced righteous people unless there was some truth in it, if you show respect for them, it is possible for you to change the hearts of Hindus the way the hearts of Orthodox Christians are now being changed. This is an application. I have mentioned three things. I have mentioned Islamic imperialism to denounce it. I have mentioned Babri Masjid, we, we, we have no claim to it. And I have mentioned show respect for the Hindu faith. This is enough already, a substantial initiative which would begin to change the hearts of many Hindus. But because we did nothing, we sat down with our feet in concrete for 70-something years, Modi has now succeeded in uniting the whole of India behind him. What's his next step? We can anticipate his next step. He doesn't want a nuclear war with Pakistan because a nuclear war will be mutually destructive. So he might probably on a Sunday morning <laughs> offer to Pakistan but we promise we will not be the first to use nuclear weapons if you would make the same promise. And if Pakistan is deaf, dumb and blind, they will accept it. And that's what he wants, a conventional war, not a nuclear war. In a conventional war, India will defeat Pakistan anyway. <laughs> because Pakistan has given up on nuclear deterrence. What does he need a conventional war for? His attack on Kashmir is not merely an attack on Islam. It's more than that. It's an attack on China. China is now posing a serious problem for the West. The Chinese Belt and Road Initiative to take Chinese manufactured products to Europe and, China, and oil from the Middle East straight to China to the Pakistani port of Wada. Wada. This is a very serious challenge to the West and they don't have any response for it. So what did they do? The Road and Belt Initiative needs the Karakoram Highway built from Pakistan to Kashgar in China. It passes through the Uyghur Muslim community. So number one, you throw some petrol and you light the fire to get the Uyghur Muslims up in arms against China in order to sabotage the Road and Belt Initiative. Number two, and vastly more dangerous, India needs a quick war, not a prolonged war, to seize that part of Kashmir which is under Pakistani control. India will claim this is our territory. We have taken part of Kashmir, it's now under our control now. We need the other part. So a lightning war, to take that part of Kashmir under Pakistan control at this time. And once India takes that, the road and belt is finished. <laughs> Why? Because the road and belt initiative uses the Karakoram Highway 
which was built over 20 years and which passes through Pakistani parts of the Kashmir territory. So the Indian government is moving forward with intelligent, strategic planning. You have to admire it. Yes. And uh, our response is <laughs> our feet in concrete. Depending on the United Nations Security Council resolutions and a man named Donald Trump. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may wake up this ummah. Number one to the importance, the strategic importance of Islamic spirituality. And number two for understanding the application of strategic, of Islamic spirituality in the strategic planning and thinking and operations of Nabi Muhammad wasalam, and the strategic sunnah. And I've delivered a lecture on the strategic sunnah. And number three, in applying that to our contemporary problems that we have, of which Kashmir is one of them. Rabbana, taqabbal minna inna ka inta samil alim, matubu alina ya mulana inna ka inta tawab rahim, barahmatika ya arhamba rahimin. Ameen. Bismillah.